The word cerebellum means little brain. It is a structure of the nervous system that has an important role in motor control. In particular, the cerebellum is important in the coordination, precision, and timing of movements, as well as motor learning and the maintenance of muscle tone, balance, and posture. The cerebellum is found at the back of the brain, within the posterior cranial fossa, inferior to the occipital and temporal lobes. It is separated from these lobes by a tough layer of dura mater called the tentorium cerebelli. The cerebellum connects to the brainstem, the pons midbrain and medulla, through the cerebellar peduncles. There are three cerebellar peduncles, the superior peduncle, the middle peduncle, and the inferior peduncle. The peduncles are very important as they connect the cerebellum to the brainstem and act to send in and send out signals from the cerebellum. The cerebellum can be divided into so many ways. So firstly, the cerebellum has two hemispheres. These are connected by a narrow midline area called the vermis. Similar to the other structures within the central nervous system, the cerebellum is made up of the gray matter and the white matter. The gray matter of the cerebellum is found on the surface of the cerebellum and forms the cerebellar cortex. And the white matter is found underneath the cerebellar cortex. The four cerebellar nuclei are embedded in the white matter of the cerebellum. These are called the dentate, emboliform, globose, and fastigi nuclei. The cerebellum can be divided into three anatomical lobes, the anterior lobe, the posterior lobe, and the flocculonodular lobe. These lobes are divided by two fissures, the primary fissure and the posterolateral fissure. Functionally, the cerebellum can be divided into three areas. These are called the cerebrocerebellum, the spinal cerebellum, and the vestibulocerebellum. The cerebrocerebellum is the largest of the three divisions and is formed by the lateral hemispheres. The cerebrocerebellum has roles in planning movements, motor learning, coordination of muscle activation, and visually guided movements. It receives input from the cerebral cortex and pontine nuclei, and it sends out signals to the thalamus and the red nucleus. The next area, the spinocerebellum, is made up of the vermis and the intermediate zone of the cerebellar hemispheres. The spinocerebellum receives proprioception information from the dorsal columns of the spinal cord, and this is responsible for coordination of movements. Lastly, the vestibulocerebellum receives information from the vestibular nuclei and the visual cortex, and it is involved in controlling balance and the ocular reflexes, in particular fixation on a target. The vestibular cerebellum receives input from the vestibular system, and it sends output back to the vestibular nuclei. Now, Let's focus on the spinocerebellum, specifically looking at the what's called spinocerebellar tracts, because clinically this is very important. So the cerebellum is able to help coordinate and refine mode of movements due to the spinocerebellar tracts. These tracts carry unconscious proprioceptive information, such as information from muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs and joint capsules all the way to the cerebellum. Proprioceptors allow us to be aware of our position of movement of our body in space. Now, there are four individual pathways. These are the posterior spinocerebellar tracts, the cuneocerebellar tracts, the anterior 
spinocerebellar tract and the rostral spinocerebellar tract. All these tracts travel from these proprioceptors up the spinal cord to the cerebellum. It is important to know that the cerebellum receives most of the input from the ipsilateral side of the body, so the same side of the body. And so cerebellar damage results in deficits to the ipsilateral side, so the same side. Now on to the vasculature, the blood supply. So the blood supply of the cerebellum comes from the three paired arteries, the superior cerebellar artery, the anterior infero cerebellar artery, and the posterior in inferior cerebellar artery. The superior cerebellar artery and the anterior inferior cerebral arteries are branches of the basilar artery, whereas the posterior inferior cerebellar artery is a branch of the vertebral artery. The venous drainage of the cerebellum is provided by the superior and inferior cerebellar veins. These veins drain into the superior petrosal, transverse, and straight dural venous sinuses. Now on to some clinical relevance, or clinical anatomy more so. Cerebellar dysfunction, or syndromes, can result in a wide variety of manifestations. So the manifestations can be remembered using the acronym DANISH. So D stands for dysdidocokinesia, which is difficulty in carrying out rapid alternating movements. A stands for ataxia, which is the presence of abnormal uncoordinated movements. N stands for nystagmus, which is repetitive, uncontrolled movements of the eye, uh, and it's usually horizontal, bilateral, for example. I stands for intention tremor, which is involuntary rhythmic muscle contractions that occur during a purposeful voluntary movement. S stands for scanning speech, which is when spoken words are broken up into separate syllables and often separated by a noticeable pause. Lastly, H is for uh, hypotonia, which means decreased muscle tone. Testing for dysdidocinesia involves asking the patient to tap the palm of one hand with the fingers of the other, then rapidly turning over the fingers and tap the palm with the back of them, and basically repeat this process. If there's any difficulty in performing this task with reduced coordination, the person has dysdidocinesis. It is important to know that because the cerebellum receives input from and controls output to the ipsilateral side of the body, cerebellar damage results in deficits to the ipsilateral, so same side of the body. Whereas if you injure your cerebral cortex, your brain, it typically causes contralateral deficits, so opposite. Acute onset of cerebellar manifestations are considered an emergency, as it can be due to vascular causes such as a stroke or hemorrhage, or cerebral edema. Chronic cerebellar syndromes can be genetic, for example, Frederick's ataxia, and spinocerebellar ataxia, or acquired conditions such as chronic alcoholism and tumors. Lesions to the medial part of the cerebellum, such as the vermis, affects axial and proximal limbs mainly, resulting in symptoms such as truncal ataxia and nystagmus. Truncal ataxia is where one has a wide-based drunken sailor gait characterized by uncertain starts and stops, lateral deviations, and unequal steps. On the other hand, lateral lesions of the cerebellum, such as the hemispheres, affects distal limb musculature, which results in symptoms such as you know, the ipsilateral limb ataxia, which manifests as intention tremor, dysmetria, past pointing, uh, when performing the so-called uh, finger-to-nose test, and dysdidocokinesis. Causes of bilateral cerebellar syndrome include demyelination due to multiple sclerosis, 
drugs and toxins such as alcohol and also anti-epileptics such as carbamazepine, which causes cerebellar atrophy, Frederick's ataxia due to gradual deterioration of the neurons in the cerebellum, multiple systems atrophy, which is a Parkinson's plus syndrome, bilateral posterior circulation strokes or space-occupying lesions, and finally, perineoplastic conditions, such as you know, antibodies that attack the cerebellum in the presence of malignancy. Unilateral cell cerebellar syndromes are caused by you know, space-occupying lesions in the posterior fossa. This could be an abscess or a tumor or a benign tumor. Demyelination again due to multiple sclerosis. Posterior circulation infarction or a hemorrhagic stroke. And also perineoplastic syndrome. In summary, this video we talked about the cerebellum, which is the structure of the nervous system that has an important role in motor control, in particular in coordination, precision, and timing of movements, as well as motor learning and the maintenance of muscle tone, balance, and posture. As well as discussing the anatomy of the cerebellum, we discuss the possible manifestations and causes of cerebellar dysfunction. Thank you for watching.